us uh, Dr. Saurav Prakash. Uh, Saurav, uh, big background, he got his bachelor's from IIT Kapoor. Subsequently, he went to the University of Southern California for his PhD. And for the past year and a half, he has been a postdoc at the uh, University of Illinois at the National State. His areas of research include information theory and coding. Primarily, in the recent past, he has been interested in distributed learning, specifically the impact of privacy in the public course. Thank you very much for is, is the voice of you? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for joining the talk and uh, thank you Professor Jacob for the kind introduction. So the title of my talk is uh, uh, Trustworthy, Efficient and Robust Distributed System. And in this presentation I'll give a brief biography, a uh, brief overview of my biography and research in this area. And then dive deeper into one of my recent uh, uh, research papers. And then subsequently, I will discuss some future research and teaching plans. So this is a brief biography of myself. Uh, the main thing I would like to highlight here is that during my PhD, I worked in both cloud computing and decentralized machine learning settings, where I was focused on addressing multiple bottlenecks that arise due to heterogeneity in resources as well as data sets. Then I also gained during my PhD, I gained some industry experience through internships at Intel and Amazon, where I was focused <coughs> on working in uh, multi-access edge computing at Intel, and Amazon, I was working on uh, large-scale uh, language model. More recently, during my postdoc, I've been working on machine fund learning, which I'll be covering in more detail soon, and also data analytics in non-Euclidean spaces, particularly the hyperbolic geometry, and then more, more recently, it's uh, around genomic security and privacy. And coming predominantly from an E background, uh, my research derives inspiration from a number of different uh, areas, including information and coding theory, communication topology design, data privacy, optimization, and so on. Here I just want to highlight that I published in many journals and conferences and I have two patents which have been approved and one is currently pending. And throughout my academic journey, I have been quite fortunate to receive multiple awards and fellowships, including the current Carl Moss uh, Postdoctoral Fellowship at the Institute for Genomic Biology at UIS. Okay, with this let me go into the motivation behind my research. So as we all know, devices in modern edge networks, they have a lot of capabilities in terms of sensing, collecting, and processing data locally. And we can say that actually the data is born currently at the edge. Furthermore, due to various concerns, particularly the data privacy concerns, a lot of computation associated with these data sets are actually being, have been uh, driven towards where the source of data is. So the, these concerns are driving the local processing of information. And naturally, this ecosystem of device local, these edge devices and gen data sets being generated at these devices is enabling a number of on-device AI and ML applications, such as the personalized healthcare. So a key question arises in these settings, how to do distributed learning at such a massive scale while ensuring privacy, security, and trust? And this question is very important for many industry ecosystems as well. For example, this company, FedML, it was founded by my PhD advisor in 2022. And when other companies were laying off, they were getting a lot of funding. So, so this the problem itself is very important. So one promising approach that has been there in some recent past is the federated learning paradigm. The main principle is very simple, train locally and then average globally. So what it means is that these clients are going to have their own local data sets. And these models are going to be trained at these client at the client level, and then they will be shared with the server, and the server is going to combine these models to obtain the final global model. So the idea, principle, main principle, as we can see, just train locally and average them globally. But the issue is that when we take the this principle and try to implement it in practice, this introduces a lot of fundamental challenges. For example, resource constraints and heterogeneity come into the picture. For example, the chat GPT model, we cannot expect them to run on our mobile phones. Training these large models is just uh, directly it's out of the scope. 
then a lot due to the decentralized nature of these systems, a lot of errors and uh, also like adversarial clients can creep into the system and they may try to like uh, corrupt the training process or the performance itself. And while the data is kept at the server side, the models themselves can leak information and there are many attacks such as the model inversion attack, then membership inference attack, where you can use and try to infer the information which was used to train these global models. So these are a lot, they, these challenges need to be addressed in order to implement federated learning in practice. So my research is to develop a comprehensive framework to overcome these barriers. Okay. So let me present some of my research contributions, uh, I'll provide a brief overview of some of my research contributions. So to address the data leakage through models and in turn make federated learning trustworthy, I have a recent work which empowers clients by enabling user data deletion from the FL models themselves. And this work I'll be covering in detail in today's talk. To address the resource constraints and heterogeneity and make federated learning efficient, I have a number of different works. So this work is, what it does is that the clients themselves can be very weak. So you cannot train a large model on the clients. But then you can use small models at the clients and still learn a large model at the server side. Then in this work, Coded Computing for Balanced Federated Learning, we kind of injected coding redundancy into the federated learning process so as to mitigate the uh, failures and uh, straggler effects that can happen during the federated learning process. So by straggler what I mean is that some of the clients may not return the updates in time. So in those situations, how to get some parity data set at the server side so that you can overcome those erasures or missing updates. Now in this work, hyperbolic federated classification so the motivation was from the genomic data sets, which are very large in practice. So these data sets, you, sorry, any question? So these data sets, uh, you can embed them into uh, hyperbolic spaces in, and use and get very low dimensional embeddings, which are very useful for processing these data sets in various machine learning applications. And for this, you, uh, if using Euclidean space is not good enough. So that's where the hyperbolic federated classification work came in. And to address errors and malicious clients and in turn make uh, federated learning robust, I have a few works. One work that I would like to highlight here is the serverless work in which we remove the server also from the federated learning setting. So if there is no server, because server can also be a point of failure. So if there is no server, how should the training be designed so that you are robust to all these malicious clients and uh, different errors into the system in the system. Do you elaborate on what the client is? Yeah, so it is just like uh, your phone cannot load a very large model, so it's limited through compute, uh, memory, communication, all that. Yeah. So these works they are very important steps towards my larger vision of having a transformative and foundational framework for large scale and privacy preserving machine learning. And these together, they would answer the question that I posed in the uh, few slides before, to do large scale machine learning at scale. I mean to do large scale machine learning with uh, safety and trust and all these uh, challenges. Okay, so with this, uh, this work I will be presenting in detail and if time permits, I will also cover this, uh, an overview of uh, this uh, most recent work I have in public. Okay, so any questions on the overview? From here, I will discuss one of my research works in detail. When your data is very large, right? And what is the motivation to train on uh, only these smaller age devices or do with federated learning rather than having the centralized learning? Well, the data privacy, like you, your genomic data would, for example, these data sets could be at the hospital side and hospitals may have privacy concerns. So different hospitals cannot pool their data with one organization. So you don't have those data sets in one place. Of course there are medical data sets in public domain, but due to privacy concerns, they are always very small, typically very small size. For example, today we were discussing about Apollo not, in, not interested or whatever in sharing their data sets for uh, even um, academic purposes. That's the main concern. So, 
Okay, so this work uh, it tries to make FL more trustworthy. So motivation is the data leakage through models. So the mo uh, main reason, the legal is the kind of legal reason, because now many privacy regulations, including GDPR in Europe and in India also now we have the India Personal Data Protection Bill, they ensure the right to be forgotten. So what it means is that any user can ask the uh, company such as Google to remove any information that they might have of the user. So for example, you might search something on Google search and you will ask it to delete uh, your particular search. But then the recommendation might already incorporate that search. So you will have to remove from the subsequent lineage of the uh, models as well. You cannot just remove the uh, data point from the data set. You also need to remove the influence from the model. And this uh, just removing, just to show that the permanent data removal from the data set is not enough, there are these attacks such as the model inversion attacks where they use some uh, auxiliary samples and they can use it to invert these noisy samples into like almost fully recognizable uh, original images. So this is a very practical problem. So the influence of the removed samples on the re uh, relevant ML models need to be also eliminated. And ninth way of course is to retrain from scratch. So this is the baseline. It, what it means is that you delete that particular data point from your data set and do the training from scratch, do the training all over again as if your data point did not exist in the database. So that's the baseline. Of course it will give you complete privacy because that means you did not even exist. But then it is computationally expensive and it's infeasible due to high frequency of data removal requests. And one practical example is the UK Biobank data set. It has a lot of health data of roughly 5 lakh UK patients. At the, at the time where I made the slides, maybe it has grown now. And they receive frequent requests in like hundreds in every few weeks or something. So the scale of removal requests is less than the entire data set. So the performance more or le less remains fine if you do retraining from scratch. But you cannot do retraining from scratch because you re keep receiving frequent requests. So this is where the machine unlearning area came up. The idea is to remove the samples from ML models efficiently. And this was the research paper that kind of formulated this idea in a formal way also proposed some initial algorithms. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this is the formal definition of unlearn. So just to introduce uh, what uh, the theoretical aspect of it would be. So X is the data set space. D would be the training set from, this would belong to this data set space. D prime would be the training set after you remove the particular sample. H would be the model space. And then randomized learning algorithm such as SGD would be your A. And then U would be the particular unlearning algorithm that you would be designing. So what it has to satisfy? It has to satisfy that probability that you get a particular model from the model space. The model space is the capital S. A probability of getting a certain model on the retraining from scratch. That should match to the unlearning algorithm on your previous input, like whatever model you had after you did the initial training. And then it will also be a function of your original data set and then the uh, data set after you remove the uh, particular sample. So probability of these two algorithms uh, giving the same model should be identical. So this is the probabilistic model equivalent. Okay. So what we consider we considered the specific problem of federated clustering. As we all know, uh, the clustering uh, is, has a lot of applications. For example, it can be used for clustering the patients. And depending on which cluster they are, you can use certain tasks such as mortality prediction and ICU state time prediction. So many applications exist, not only in medical uh, uh, domain, but also in many other domains. So we consider machine and learning and federated clustering kind of for the first time. And only a handful of results were known just for federated unlearning at that time. And even today, the results which are there for federated unlearning, they, are, they have a lot of issues in performance and they kind of overlook a lot of things in my opinion. And also at this time, no previous work did machine unlearning for federated clustering uh, domain. So our goal is multidimensional. Our Main ta uh, one of the main goals is to have low communication and computational complexity and then also good clustering performance because uh, if 
you design an algorithm, federated learning algorithm that requires uh, some to be to do it for you to do something so that your actual problem of federated learning problem it gets affected, then it's not good. So the main task, whatever it is, here for us it is federated clustering, the performance should not be affected that much. And then we also need to satisfy some privacy criteria when we do the training, because that is also one of the core principles of federated learning. And then we should also have low complexity unlearning, because again unlearning is motivated by saying that it should be done efficiently. We should not do retraining from scratch. So all this is the multi-dimensional goal in our problem setting. So what is the privacy criteria? The privacy criteria is that the server should have, so the global, from the global model, what it should not have come to know about the local model. So it should only have, it should only be able to recover the aggregate information corresponding to the client data sets and not the individual information. So this is the privacy criteria that we use. And this is kind of there in federated learning from the time federated learning started. So for example, there is something called secure model aggregation. So secure model aggregation, it works something like this. So consider clients 1 and 2 and the goal is to recover the sum G1 plus G2. So G is equal to G1 plus G2. This is the goal. But server should not be able to recover any individual models from the sum. So I mean in this process server should not get access to any individual model. So what they, what the principle behind secure aggregation is that you add noise at client. So client 1 will add some epsilon, client 2 will subtract that epsilon noise and at the server side you will get the sum. So these noises will get cancelled out. So this is the like one of the basic uh, methods behind secure aggregation. And we developed the first analog for clustering, federated clustering. Okay. So this is the. Oh. So does that mean the clients can communicate that noise to each other? So this is a good question. So the thing is that the each pair of clients need to come up with a private key, and there is a public pseudo random number generator. You will feel after getting each pair of clients getting a shared private key, they will generate same noise because there is a common pseudo random number generator. But for the server side it's not involved in these communications. But clients need to do this. But of course there are, there can be malicious clients and all that. I'm, I'm not considering this. This is the fundamental principle. Okay. So this is the formal description of the federated k-means clustering problem. So there are L clients, then number of clusters is k. So what I mean by that is that the server needs to find some k global centroids, which is denoted by this set. And we want to optimize this loss function. All it means is that the server side centroid, it should be kind of close to all the uh, local client data sets. So this is just like the standard clustering loss in the federated setting. And then uh, the, yeah. So the prior works in this domain include KFED. So KFED was in ICMR 2021, it considered both accuracy and communication efficiency. But then it had very limited privacy, maybe I should go to that. But it had very limited uh, privacy protection because they did not consider the privacy aspects of aggregation and all these things. And it has high computational complexity and also it actually requires very strong assumptions on data distribution because it, in principle, it, it it requires like the number of classes, uh, number of uh, local clusters uh, that should have each client have should be maximum of root k, where k is the number of global clusters you want to know. So very strong assumptions on the data. Sec FC it considers both accuracy and privacy, but again it has very high computation and communication overhead. And none of these works have any support for unlearning, and it's not that you can directly apply some. Uh, technique on top of these, but they fundamentally it's very difficult to integrate and learning into these. Okay, so we developed the first solution addressing these multi-dimensional trade-offs and design our algorithm for federated clustering so that it is suitable for machine and learning. Okay, so this is the overall framework. I'll go over each of them in detail, but uh, the key aspects are we need to do some client-side clustering because this like the local model training. And then some information processing so that we can convey the information of local centroids to the server. 
and then the server is going to have some step of doing secure aggregation and then there is some step involved to generate uh, some artificial data sets corresponding to the information received from the client and then finally the step to compute the global set of centers. Okay, so let me go over each, uh, go, uh, over each of them in detail. So client side, K-means plus plus initialization. So what K-means plus plus initialization is? K-means plus string has to be done both on client and server side. So K-means plus plus was the first randomized algorithm which developed the bounds, the first theoretical bounds for doing K-means plus string. And the key contribution was there was that you would have a randomized initialization based design for clustering and just that randomized initialization guaranteed the log k approximation for optimal loss. Subsequently, you can further improve through multiple iterations, but just this initialization has a lot of uh, formal guarantees and it also works well in practice. So we would do K-means plus plus initialization on the local data. And intuition for K-means plus plus initialization, the way it works is like this. Let's say this, this is a set of data points. So first one you select uniformly at random. Then the second one, it's kind of selected to be as far as possible from the current centroid set. So here it's just one centroid. So your selection probability would be kind of proportional to the distance of each point from the centroid set. And for example, let's say this is the one which is farthest. So it will kind of get selected with a high probability. And then the next one would be selected somewhere far from both of these. Of course, this is a probabilistic process. You can have all three here, but then in practice, this works well when you have large data set. So, so clients have done local K-means plus plus initialization, and now they have to communicate some information pertaining to the uh, local centroids to the server. And server will do K-means plus plus initialization and Lloyd's algorithm. So Lloyd's algorithm is like this. So you do the initialization, let's say through K-means plus plus initialization, and these are all your data points. For each of these centroids, you find which of the data points are closest to the centroid. Then you, that is called the cluster assignment step. And then you do a means update, which means that these points belong to the blue cluster, so you will update the mean of the blue cluster. And then you repeat this process for some criteria, and let's say after convergence, you get this type of uh, global centroid. So now let me, so any, any questions at this point? So now let me get into how to communicate this information about centroids to the server side. So main thing I would like to highlight here is that, let's say I consider the first client. So this is going to have the centroid at this one because you see K-means plus plus initialization is just selecting a set of points from the actual data set as you uh, local cluster as the local k -mean. So then let's say this is one of the points. So we need to first quantize them. So you quantize the point to the bin of the uh, local bin center. And then we need to record the weights of these centroids. So this centroid has five data points, so you will record a weight of five and similarly here six and seven and so on. What server needs, server needs the global information like in this bin how many data points uh, are there associated with this bin. So kind of weighted centroid uh, information. This we need to transmit to the server and obtain an aggregate information. And this, this recording of local cluster sizes, somehow the previous works of federated clustering, they missed this step. And their performance uh, got affected because they did not consider the weighting for some reason, whatever reason. Anyway, so after you have this information that you know which bins are non-zero, so you need to transmit which bins are non-zero and also the values of the bins to the server so that the server retrieves the global information of which uh, bins are non-zero and the global sum across the client. So you flatten the client L information matrix to let's say a vector for information transmission purposes and then the next step would be to transmit this information. Now main aspect of this is that vectors are very sparse because if you quantize the space you have like b to the d uh, elements uh, in total, d is the number of dimensions and you have only k elements at each client and we are assuming that k is a constant so you can see that uh, if you increase dimension to even 4 or 5 and b is roughly like you said 1000 so then 
number b to the d scales very fast so, and you know, need to transmit only k out of these the others are just zero so we intuition is that first compress the vectors then perform some sparse secure aggregation this so, quantization, is there a step to decide like how, how much to quantize uh, or is that you assume that it's, it's given? Mm, so, we have one theoretical result and you can optimize it also, but that in practice it doesn't affect the result uh, that much. So, it's more like a hyperparameter. But you can say that uh, all these numbers such as int and float in practice in the machine level, they are also doing quantization, right? So, that type of quantization quantize it and you need to not transmit the information. So it doesn't matter if you over quantize and it's like very very sparse. Yeah, so another thing is that to do secure aggregation, you are the space that you need to work with in order to add the noises, it has to be like high quantity, otherwise you will reveal a lot of noise. So that's also where you need a high amount of quantization. And the finer you do the quantization, the better, right? So that's another aspect. Yeah, but the exact one it's kind of hyperparameter, but yeah. So again, the general problem, you have like uh, one vector at each client, each is very sparse, and then you just want to recover the sum at the server. And what the information is essentially, bin indices and the associated values. So this is where we solve the general problem, and again, the challenge is that you cannot communicate the bins which are non-zero, otherwise it would be violation of your privacy. Okay, so proposal is to compress through encoding and the encoding we were inspired by Reed Solomon code construction. Uh, the high level idea is that you are going to construct equations out of your local bin information and equations look something like this. Ignore ZI for the moment. So equation looks something like this. So this is like a Reed Solomon type of code construction. But there the evaluation points are the bin indices. So the bins that I was showing in terms of grid. So those are the bin indices. And then the values which correspond, uh, these are the values which are contained in those bin indices. So we encode both the information corresponding to the bin index and the information corresponding to the bin value into these equations. And then these are transmitted to the server side. And the server, and each uh, for unique decodability purpose and all that, uh, we need to transmit two KL equations from each client. And then we need to have this type of noise also added. So this is where the secure aggregation noise part comes in. So, but now you need to only add secure aggregation noise on vectors of size 2k instead of b to the d. So this kind of uh, is our main, one of the main contributions. And then this achieves optimal comple communication complexity of order log p. So the prior works which we were working in this general problem of sparse secure aggregation, they had a complexity of order p. They were improving in absolute terms, but then the order wise it was still p. But we kind of go all the way to log p. And this is just an example to illustrate what we are doing. So let's consider this vector at client 1, 0, 1, 4, 0. So index values for this is 2 and 3. And then the bin values are 1 and 4. So 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4. And then, then uh, these are the uh, bin indices, 2 and 3 you raise it to multiple powers. Here you need to have eight equations, so you go all the way from zero to seven. After doing this, you add the noises, six, nine, five, and you can see six and minus six, they get cancelled out. So this is like just to illustrate the principle, and of course, this is our, this can be done for many clients and all these. Okay, so on SCMA decoding, uh, the decoding is that uh, the server is going to receive all these 2KL equations and aggregate version of them. So this is uh, the aspect of the secure aggregation. It doesn't get individual uh, equations from the client. And for decoding, if one can exploit decoding algorithms from standard Reed-Solomon codes. And these are just some steps involved in towards decoding the Reed-Solomon codes. And server, now we can see it cannot infer the information about any individual vector and hence the privacy criteria is satisfied. Okay. So this is our gen, one of the main contributions in this thing. So now at the server side, what it has received, it has received that, okay, at some client, there are non-zero values in this, uh, these bins, and it has a global information of how many points are there in these bins. So now it can do the k-means clustering in two ways. 
one way is that it is it will just consider these bin centers as the points data points and then assign them weights which is these global sums 93713 so here it will just consider that there are four points and then let's say it is doing uh, it needs to find k equal to three clusters another way is that it can generate nine data points in this quantization bin, three data points in this bin, and so on. And we find, and then do the k-means clustering on a sum of uh, 20 and then 32 points. So this we find that it has lower, uh, uh, it has better clustering loss. So in all our theoretical results and for experimental purpose, we use the second method where we uniformly draw points, draw points from each quantization bin, and then do the k-means clustering. So this, with this actually, I have tried to cover the details of the approach. Any questions are there? Then I would dive into the results. So you haven't come to the unlearned part. No, no. So the way we do it, it will enable unlearning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. So how do the noises add up? So the noises are locally generated in each Which noise? So you have to see as it add up to zero or not. Yeah, yeah, so, so those noise are added through like each pair of clients is going to have a private key uh, exchange and then those uh, private keys would be used to generate noises for uh, using some pseudo random number generator. So two clients, same noise will be generated, one will add, one will subtract, so that sort of. Okay. So this, these are some theoretical results. So main thing I want to show here is that the federated clustering laws, it is order case log square k optimal. So this is the optimal centralized loss, assuming that all the data is in one place, all the client data is in one place, what is the optimal loss? And then we achieve, we are like even doing federated clustering with this simple approach. Uh, we are able to get log square k order optimal for one shot federated clustering. And, and yes, we are doing just one shot. There is no iterations involved in this. So it's also communication efficient and other aspects are there. The prior work of the ICML work, they didn't have theoretical guarantees. And then uh, this optimization one that I was talking earlier, is just like a, for a theoretical standpoint, you can further optimization this term, optimize this term, and then the quantization is like one over root n. But in practice, we didn't see much uh, effect of this. Okay, now the unlearning part. So there are two types of removal requests to do unlearning. So unlearning again, uh, some client might request a data point to be removed. So we need to see how to do the model of data client side and then the server side. Two types of removal requests are there. One is the random removal, where any data point is uh, uh, has a chance of getting removed uniformly at random. Uh, so this is random removal. And then this is for worst case analysis. This is the adversarial removal. Here the assumption is that somehow uh, the sorry, somehow the person uh, who knows somehow the person knows which uh, data points are there and somehow knows the outlier data points and it will try to request uh, the outlier data points to be removed. Now, the way k means plus plus initialization work, uh, these data points which are far from the uh, uh, set on average, of the set of data points on average, they are more likely to be in the centroid set. Now, if you keep requesting data points which are outliers to be removed, then more likely they will be in the centroid set and then they will become more likely to be uh, unlearned. And then, because of that, you will have to train more frequently. So this is for worst case analysis. And now, the algorithm. The algorithm is actually turns out to be very simple and effective. So the, let's, this is the request. XR is a set of data points which need to be removed from client L. So the idea is that only we need to unlearn only at client L. And then, so it's subsequent effect at the server side. Client side unlearning. All it needs to do is that, does the, the, is there any intersection between the removal set and the centroid set? If there is any intersection, you just rerun k-means plus plus initialization over the uh, remaining data set. If there is no intersection, just keep CL unchanged. So because the way we designed the algorithm, this unlearning became very simple. Yes. Other, uh, yeah, so we'll have to redesign. So centroid always has to be one of the data points, right? Like a meteoroid. Or... Yeah, initialize because we just uh, restricted ourselves to initializing it. If we run the Lloyd type of iteration, then it will go into means. Right. 
So we didn't go there because we wanted a more tractable uh, unlearning. Yes. And at the and again, as uh, Professor Amit was mentioning, the key observation is that the centroid are the true data points. And there is this we prove in the paper that the way we do it, it enables exact unlearning and satisfies the formal exact unlearning criteria I described earlier. And server side unlearning just rerun the full K means plus plus algorithm. Okay, so with this I have described the clustering and also the unlearning part. And now let me get into the results. So the this is the result for unlearning. So we have requested our data points to be removed. So what this result is showing is that we have recovered the performance of retraining from scratch. So and this is applicable to both adversarial and random removal treatments. So now where the difference comes in, the difference comes uh, uh, for I mean difference uh, for adversarial and random removal. The effect comes in removal time, complexity analysis. For both of them, we have low retraining probability comp compared to retraining from scratch. So asymptotically, they are much faster than retraining from scratch. But then, yeah. So I'll, I'll just show this result. So probability of retraining uh, for random removal is like order k over n because we have k centroids. So intuitively, any of them can be uh, selected to be removed. So you have like k over n l uh, probability. For adversarial removal, we need to have some assumptions in order to do theoretical analysis. So there, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 are related to the data set uh, constraints, uh, data set parameters. And the result is that it is order k square epsilon 1, epsilon 2 over nm. And epsilon x1, epsilon 2 both are larger than or equal to 1. But still, we can see that uh, this is much less order wise compared to retraining pro complexity of 1, which is the uh, the retraining from scratch probability. And adversarial uh, removal as a higher complexity. Okay. So now, after getting the complexity, we can now see if you have R removal request and what is the overall time complexity. So time complexity results are also like that type of thing that you have a larger time complexity for adversarial removal, and but still they are much faster than retraining from scratch. And then complexity does not scale with the data. So these are the main results. So server side, this is just like at the server side you have some complexity of doing Lloyd iterations every time you have to do uh, retraining at some point. Okay, so now let me get into some of the simulation results. Our baselines are retraining from scratch. Effect, as I mentioned earlier, although it does not have any unlearning support, we use it for comparing the federated clustering performance uh, uh, in, uh, like it was a prior state of art for federated clustering, so we use it for comparing the performance. DC KMIS is just like another baseline for uh, uh, a machine unlearning in federated set. So, loss ratio, so we will present two metrics loss ratio, which is a federated learning loss of your algorithm. And then this is an approximation of the optimal clustering loss. So what we do here is that we run full k means plus plus algorithm on the entire client data set. Like you assume all the data set is in one place and you run full k means plus plus algorithm uh, because there is no algorithm which actually achieves the optimal uh, clustering loss. So that's the whole best thing we can do. So we run it for many, uh, many rounds and whichever is the best we select it as the uh, optimal as an approximation to the optimal clustering loss. So we will present. I will present the loss ratio. Lower the better. And the uh, accumulated removal time is the unlearning complexity wall clock time. Assuming that we have some uh, machine for client and some machine for server. So using that uh, uh, like system, uh, what is the wall clock removal time complexity? Okay. So these are some loss ratios. So we also I have a lot of uh, biological data sets. So TCG, I think it's the bulk sequencing data set and cell type single sequencing. But anyway, so these are some of the biological data sets, TMI, cell type, and TCGA. And then these are feminist and all our standard uh, vision related data set. So thing to note here is that our algorithm, which is the MUFC, it has much lower loss almost every time compared to the prior uh, KFED algorithm. And one thing we noticed here, the reason was that they did not consider the centroid weights when they were communicating the centroid information. 
Yeah, so that would be the next slide. So this, uh, because retraining is uh, the complexity analysis part. So this is the retraining wall clock. Uh, re, uh, this is the wall clock time for the overall removals. So this red one is the completely retraining from scratch. And this y-axis is actually log. So we can see that the gain is much, much, it's, it's, it's quite large. So compared to just retraining from scratch, which is the red line, both MUFC and the DC chemis, they have a lot of gain. And compared to DC chemis, also MUFC has a lot of gain. So this we can see across all data sets and uh, data distribution setting. Another thing to highlight, uh, that I want to highlight here is that consider these uh, two settings, random removal and adversarial removal. So we can see here, let's say after 200 removal requests, the amount of time it took is less than, let's say, 10 seconds. And here we see that it is larger than 10 seconds. Why it happened? Because we needed to do retraining more frequently because of the adversarial requests. But still the overall time is much less compared to both uh, DC chemis and the uh, retraining from scratch. So what is uh, different between the last two data sets like uh, DC chemis is closer to uh, retraining in the second data set and that closer to your method and the So we, we saw that uh, these data sets have different disbalances and uh, associations within themselves. So these things change quite a bit with what data set to use. For example, this one uh, with this Gaussian. So Gaussian, both our method and KFED perform very similar. Main reason was that we the way we sampled the Gaussian data set was that same number of data points from each uh, mean, me, each uh, K, K, K Gaussian, yeah. yes, yes, yeah, yeah, Gaussian mixture model, yeah. So then we can see that since the data set is so balanced, so it doesn't affect, the weight factor doesn't affect. So these things affect the uh, other, set, other parts, like here different data set, different works, but still we are always known. So why the red and green is smooth? It seems like the blue is simulated and others very so, so all are similar, right? So, but how come they are so, uh, the smooth lines but the blue ones are tagging? Yeah, so blue ones here, it denotes that for many removal requests, you didn't need to retrain at all. Retraining from scratch is like you always have to retrain. And DCK means is somewhat uh, requiring uh, kind of retraining from scratch. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you the exact difference. So the thing is that here in red curve, what we do is that we simulate, if there is a removal request at a client, every client does the uh, algorithm. Again, every DC chemist, all it does is that whatever client has been requested for data deletion, only that client deletes and the server deletes. So, so because of data heterogeneity and all this, there is a lot of difference from retraining from scratch where every client is retraining and DC chemist where only that client is deleting. So DC chemist has to delete because, uh, I mean, the way it is designed, you have to uh, kind of delete the influence by returning from scratch. Okay. So the bands around the lines, they signify something? So why does the green one and the left bottom not have a band and all the other green have a band, the green band? Oh, green bands, uh, so these are like di across different seeds, how much variation is there? So the left uh, bottom one, the green one has a band, but none of the other green. So this, this one like a random remove, so actually it has a band if I zoom oh, in, so very little, yeah, very little, yeah. yeah. This is more like adversarial removal, you are trying to remove uh, points adversarially, it has more variation. Yeah. The data sets are different, clients are visual, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the data sets are different, clients are visual, right? Yes, yes. Uh, at least we assume, yes. That's a, another good problem, like if the same patient goes to two hospitals, then we'll have to request at both places. But for our case, we consider the data set to be destroyed. Then what was the point of running again the, the uh, algorithm for all clients? Oh, that was the simplest baseline. Like was so, so ideal, ideally for this, uh, we can say that we should focus on the green one, green one and the blue one, which is DCK means and us. But uh, point there was that just to show that if everyone is doing very nicely, everyone has, is doing the retraining from scratch, then what is the effect? And another thing I would say is that uh, the exact unlearning would definitely be satisfied if everyone retrains from scratch. Those clients may not get the request, right? Only the client where there is a data, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that you are you are right. So so that's true. But then the uh, formulation which is there for exact time learning that may not be satisfied if you do complete uh, if you do not retrain from all the time. Because uh, some clients you have had multiple iterations locally, and then the global server kind of has combined those information. So okay, maybe maybe yeah, yeah, you are right. So there also I think the exact unlearning criteria will still be satisfied if only one client is deleted. Yeah, I think you are right. Yeah, in in practice I don't think people will do the red one. Yeah, you are right. But yeah, green one probably is the best marker for us. Yeah, but then we are much better than that. So summary, we have studied exact machine and learning for federated clustering and in contrast to heuristic learning methods, we provide theoretical guarantees and a very good performance in practice. And of course, there are many open problems, metrics to measure privacy, exact and efficient unlearning for iterative federated learning and then characterizing the optimal privacy, accuracy, efficiency trade-offs. So there are so many open problems in this direction. So this is related to one of, okay, so this may be in interest of time, I'll skip this. Uh, overview work and go into my future plan. Also, one thing also here I want to just quickly highlight, in my PhD I was working on cloud computing settings. The idea there is that you have data set, all the data set in one place, but then you just need to allocate the data set to multiple machines and have multiple tasks done efficiently. And again, the many challenges that arise there are stragglers, bandwidth, heterogeneity and so on. So how to optimally mitigate these challenges? I studied some of the problems here. And there are some contributions I made where in large scale matrix multiplication, graph analytics, and distributed learning. 